Thank you. Welcome to Legally Bond, Building an Authentic Identity and Leveraging Your Squad. What? Like it's hard? This program is sponsored by the ABA Young Lawyers Division. Today, you are in for a treat an engaging and inspiring conversation led by four young lawyers, friends, and bar leaders. My name is Tamara Nash. I'm a prosecutor in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and this year I have the honor of serving as the administrative director for the ABA YLD. Previously, I have served as the diversity and inclusion director, and I'm also a past president of the South Dakota Young Lawyer Section. Joining me today are three rock star women whom I am blessed to call my best friends. Let's take a moment to introduce them. First, Joanne Burnett. Joanne serves as an Associate Director of Career and Professional Development at Stetson University College of Law in Florida. During her time in the ABA YLD, Joanne served in several capacities, including as the Director of the Professional Development Team. Next, we have Shada Lee. Shada is an employment lawyer and partner at Baron Liebman in Oregon. Currently, Shada serves as one of the two Young Lawyer members on the ABA Board of Governors, and she is a past president of the Multnomah Bar Association Young Lawyers section in Oregon. And last but not least, we have Sheila Willis. Sheila is an associate at Fisher Phillips in South Carolina, and this year, Sheila serves as one of the four Wildy representatives to the ABA House of Delegates. She's also the immediate past president of the South Carolina Young Lawyers Division. Welcome, my friends. All right, let's begin. So, four lawyers walk into Don Antonio's Pizza in New York City. No, this isn't the beginning of a lame joke with a terrible punchline. It's the story of us, our squad. Now today, as we weave through the complicated and sometimes nuanced topics of identity, authenticity, and developing personal networks, we will circle back to this story. But more importantly, by the end of today's program, you will be empowered to leverage your own authenticity and professional networks to create your very own story. Much of what we will discuss today will be on creating and fostering professional networks. Now, for most lawyers, this means bar associations, whether it be local, state, or national bar associations. And what is interesting for the four of us is that our very unique and professional journeys all happen to converge in the same place at the same time. And this group's story comes from each of our commitments to the American Bar Association Young Lawyers Division, or the ABA YLD. Now, it, that led us to form this squad, a dynamic and empowering professional network, if I don't say so myself. Now, each of us were involved in our own local bar communities, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But since the formation of our group began with service on a national level, let's start there. And first, I'd like each of you to give our audience a snapshot of what brought you to the ABA YLD table and what your expectations were. And Shada, I'll turn to you first. Can you tell us what your answer is? Sure. So first of all, very happy to be here with you all today. Um, I will start by saying that my expectation was not to get three best friends out of that volunteer experience, but I did, and that's why we're all here. So I will though first give a plug to how much it matters when a trusted friend or colleague makes a professional recommendation. So for me, a coworker of mine was involved in leadership at the ABA YLD. 
Um, and he shared with me about how meaningful his experience had been and all these opportunities it had provided to him. And that was my initial nudge, a real person to person connection. So although I took that colleague's recommendation to get involved, let me be clear about how he framed it. His suggestion was not, hey, attend some conferences and you'll get to meet some nice people and go out to dinner. His suggestion was attend the conferences, figure out what positions and committees you'd like to apply for, because this opportunity is as meaningful and fulfilling as what you ultimately put into it. To me and to that colleague, and this will be a theme throughout today's presentation, professional development could basically be rephrased as, quote, an opportunity to do more work than you are currently doing, very likely for free, because you are genuinely interested in the growth and exposure that are afforded to you, and therefore you apply yourself just as willingly and diligently as you would to your paid work, end quote. So that's kind of the expectation that I came in with. Um, so I did attend a few conferences. I used that time to meet and consult with other ABA YLD members about what committees they were involved with. Um, and ultimately I decided on a couple of different paths. Um, first, I wanted to get involved with substantive work around labor and employment, since that's my actual area of practice. Um, second, with the division's efforts around diversity and inclusion, because that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and then third, with what we call affiliates, which is basically the connection between the ABA Young Lawyers Division at the national level and its relationship with um, bar organizations at the local level, um, which was really meaningful to me because I was already involved in bar organizations locally, which we'll talk about a bit later. So I picked areas of involvement that required me to put in real time and effort, um, and that time and effort is ultimately what led me to meet these three ladies and not just meet them, but work with them, engage with them, collaborate on projects with them, get to know them for real. So the takeaway from my experience in terms of bar involvement at the national level is this. I came in focused on putting work into the actual volunteering and by doing that in a way that was true to me and meaningful to my personal and uh, professional career development, I came away with people and relationships that are incredibly meaningful to me. And now I try to plug ABA membership everywhere I can because it's not just a line item to add to my online bio. It's an experience from which I derived a lot of personal and professional benefit. So that's my story. Awesome. I couldn't agree more with that definition. Spot on. Uh, Sheila, let's kick it over to you. What are your thoughts? Thanks, guys. And I have to agree with Shada. I did not think that I was going to join the ABA YLD and get really best friends and best friends from all over the country, really. I mean, if I, if you had told me, you know, before I joined this, that I would have a friend in South Dakota and someone in Oregon, I would think that you were crazy. Florida, not so much, because I mean, you're like right there. <laughs> but if you said I would have, I know someone like really close in South Dakota, sure, or Oregon, I would have said, no, that's crazy. Um, but this has been a really, really incredible experience for me. Um, I got involved in the ABO YLD. Um, I actually started in the law student division. I thought, you know, joining the legal profession the ABA, that's just the place to do, like everyone's a member, if you're a lawyer, and I uh, did some work in the law student division, and then when I uh, took a little bit of a break off, and then when I got involved in my local bar association, the South Carolina Bar Young Lawyers Division, so many of our leaders, so many of the people that I looked up to um, were involved in the ABA YLD, and they were doing a great job. And the ABA YLD afforded me an opportunity to not only serve, but also continue to do programming and leadership. Because before I went to law school, I used to be in management at um, a big box retail store and also at a fast food restaurant. And so I had all these experiences and training to be a leader. And I was a baby lawyer and no one was letting me lead anything. Um, and so I got to kind of exercise those skills in the ABA YLD. Um, and I spent a lot of my time doing very membership focused things. And we'll talk about it a little later, but I am involved in a lot of organizations and I seem to find myself in a membership role, figuring out how to articulate the value of the organization to its members, how to keep members engaged. That's really where my passion is and developing programs and that sort of thing. And that's actually how I met Joanne before we got into our, our Bay thing as we had um, um, really good connections doing membership type events. 
Um, and then from our practice perspective, obviously I'm a lawyer, I do labor and employment work, and I really wanted to have a national practice and doing and being a part of a national organization really seemed to fit right into kind of the trajectory. So for me, it was almost a no brainer. It checked all the boxes of things that I wanted to check in terms of an organization. And um, what I have gotten out of it is way more than I thought that I would have. Very cool. You mentioned one thing I, I neglected to talk about is you said the word base. And I want to let our audience know what that means. Um, so I said we're a squad. We're much more than that. Uh, because we're extra, we have named ourselves. Uh, we are the ABA base. You'll hear other people maybe use that term, but we live it. So just want to clue you in on that small detail. Um, all right, Joanne, to you, my love, what is your answer? So I got involved with the ABA YLG after I stopped practicing law, which was super perfect timing. Um, so I left, I was an assistant public defender before coming to Stetson to work in career and professional development. And an opportunity came for me to basically like hang out with the law students to go to one of the meetings in the law student division. And so I was working with our law students, just trying to be there to be supportive and learn a little bit about the ABA when one of my law students said, hey, I'm going to go to this YLD reception. Do you want to go? And I was like, oh, sure, why not? You know, we're hanging out in Chicago. Why not? Um, and it was there actually I ran into a friend of mine from law school just completely randomly. And we ended up talking. I learned a little bit more about her involvement in the YLD. And she just seemed to be having such a great time. And so I remember coming back to Florida and sending her a note saying like, look, I really had a great time. And I said those magic words, like, I think I'd like to learn a little more and get a little more involved. And that is sort of how it all started. Um, and then she was kind enough to think of me when there was an opening uh, to serve as a delegate to Florida in the Young Lawyers Division Assembly. And so that's really where I got involved, really focusing and being connected with um, my local Florida Young Lawyers Division. And that was great. And I met some people there and again said, oh, you know, I think I'd like to get a little bit more involved. And then I had someone encourage me to apply for um, a position with uh, the credentials board, and then I ended up being encouraged to apply for a leadership position and so on and so on. And so I was always kind of a little bit nudged. Um, but what I loved about it was I, I was sort of unique um, in many ways in the YLD because I wasn't really a traditionally practicing lawyer, but I really wanted to stay connected to the profession that served me well professionally, and it helped me be a better advocate for my students. Um, so I was about halfway through sort of my YLD tenure. I've since aged out, so I'm part of the OLD now. Um, but I was about halfway in and a lot of my Florida friends that I had really stayed kind of close to had begun to kind of find their own ways and some of them had aged out. And I remember thinking like, I really love being a part of this. I love the opportunities I'm getting for leadership experiences and getting involved. Um, but if I'm going to do this, like I really need to find some friends here um, and some, I need to like branch out and get a little bit out of my comfort zone. And it was this New York meeting where we had this wonderful pizza where I, I remember specifically going into this conference saying, okay, I am going to make some new friends and I am really going to branch out and, um, and meet people. And um, I literally hit the jackpot. So for me, the YLD um, gave me a lot of opportunities to showcase how I could contribute to the profession and stay close to the profession. And also, like she said, be able to meet people from all over the country who I would have never, ever had the chance to meet. And I'm just really grateful. I'm really grateful. Awesome. I think you really hit the nail on the head with um, how the YLD is such a home for everyone. We are the home of the young lawyer. And with you being, uh, you know, in a unique position, not really practicing, you still fit right in and um, found your stride. So I think that's such an excellent point. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about my path. Um, I began my involvement with ABA YLD in 2016, which feels like light years from now. Um, 
I, like um, everyone else, was super involved in my local affiliate, uh, South Dakota. Um, and I attended my first meeting at ABA Midyear in San Diego, which was awesome in February, coming from South Dakota, let me tell you. Uh, and prior uh, to my time at uh, attending or prior to attending ABA Wild Dean meetings, I just really felt like something was missing for me. Um, to just be really frank, I'm one of the very few attorneys of color practicing in South Dakota. Um, and as you can imagine, that is sometimes a very isolating and lonely experience. And so I really craved interaction with people who looked like me looked like me and did what I did and who had shared experiences. Um, and I attended my first meeting and was just totally blown away uh, for several reasons. First, just the sheer diversity and representation of all people was amazing. And beyond that, um, I saw myself reflected back in the lawyers who were attending those meetings. And that was inspiring. And the second reason I was blown away was this palpable energy. Um, I found myself empowered and rejuvenated and sharing a space with these passionate and selfless and intelligent young attorneys from everywhere across the country who just really cared. Um, and you've heard from my colleagues how much service means to them and giving back and representing the community. And, you know, that's what everyone uh, who's involved in bar service believes in. And you're in this room full of all these people who believe that truly to their core. It was just an energy that I needed at that time. And so the ABA WOWD fills several buckets for me. Um, and I think the what I got is, uh, I'm continuing to learn the what I got from it. Um, every day I discover a new layer to that answer. Uh, but I would say right now, it's community and resources. And I think especially in the times of COVID, um, we are acutely aware of what community means. And um, not only do I have these three awesome ladies to rely on, I have a national network of folks to call up when I happen to be in their town and want to grab ice cream, or I have a reference for a professional um, thing that I need, um, or I just have a really cool buddy to chat with and Zoom with and um, get a resource that I might need. Uh, so I think it's just an awesome, excellent thing to be a part of. And I think a reoccurring theme you'll learn is we are all somewhat of ABA Wild Beach junkies and maybe just joining thing junkies. So uh, you'll quickly learn that about us, but so many things there. And thank you uh, folks for sharing uh, what you expected and somewhat of what you've gotten. And to our audience, as you can see, we each had our own reasons uh, for coming to the ABA Wild D, but ultimately, we gained something profound and unexpected, a foundation of friendship. And of course, that took a lot of introspection, a lot of vulnerability, and a little bit of elbow grease, and maybe a slice of pizza or two or three uh, to make that happen. So now let's peel back the layers and talk about what it took us to get there. And Sheila, I'd like, like to kick it over to you first. Um, what do you think we should be highlighting first? So the first thing that I want to talk about with this group is professional authenticity. So authenticity is this concept of being able to be yourself. And oftentimes that's difficult in a professional environment. And I think it's even more difficult in the legal profession. Um, sometimes you feel like you have to kind of play the game. And there is some truth to that. Um, being quote unquote a professional may not be something that new lawyers are familiar with, especially if you've never had a job before, which many new lawyers um, find that to be the case. Um, there are also landmines in place uh, where your experience or lack thereof can make or break you in an environment. And so trying to figure out that authenticity that is a it's a it's a landmine of kind of navigate through that. And then you've got this other layer of what happens when you're trying to play this game and none of the pieces look like you. 
Um, this was my story and it's the story of so many other lawyers. Uh, when I first attended law school, I knew no other lawyers. I had no other lawyers in my family. You couple that with the lack of lawyers of color in the profession and it adds this whole other layer of uncertainty on how to be authentic. Um, and when some people think about authenticity, they may think in big ways like, what aspects of your personality can you bring to the table? Um, but for me, honestly, my question started a little bit earlier with some more basic things of, you know, can I wear my hair the way I want, knowing the perceptions and stereotypes about Black women and their hair? Um, when we were talking about weekend activities, how do I address the, no, I didn't go to the lake this weekend. I'm not really sure what lake you're talking about. Um, no, I wasn't at my friend's parents' beach house this weekend. I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't, and I don't even have a frame of reference for that. Can I be authentic in that without letting it slide that I'm somehow not in this club? So I had to find a way to present myself as professional and fit in while also being true to myself and not really disparaging my background. Um, find a way that didn't misrepresent myself, but also in a way that didn't make me stand out in a negative way. So I started to pick and choose things that I shared at work and pick the audience for sharing those things. And one of the times where I trusted myself to be a little bit more vulnerable and uh, share a little bit about myself is actually how I ended up with this group of friends. I was at an ABA meeting and I was supposed to be meeting a group of people and they forgot about me. I'm not going to tell the audience who they were, but they forgot about me. And I was waiting there all by myself. And I was sitting in uh, this hotel lobby and uh, Tamara was sitting across from me and she came over. She's like, hey, are you here for the conference? And I was like, yes. And she's like, well, do you want to come sit with us? Now, in that moment, I could have just, been, no, I'm fine. Like, I have I have people, they've not totally not forgotten me. Like, I'm totally fine. But instead, I said, I would love that. This is my first conference. I don't really know a lot of people here. I would love to sit down and talk with you. And so we sat down. We had appetizers. She got my phone number. She said, I don't know if those people are ever going to show up, but if they don't, um, here's my number. I'll text you tonight and tell you what we're doing. And please come meet with us. Please come talk. Um, please come hang out. And I'm so glad that in that moment, I decided to be authentic and a little vulnerable, but I also was thoughtful about the way that I did that, because you do have to be thoughtful about how you approach those things. Um, and one of the other things that I did in terms of, you know, finding this authenticity and trying to figure out how to balance that was really rely heavily on some trusted professionals. And Joanne, I would really love to get your perspective on this because I relied heavily on career services at my law school to give me some guidance on how to handle this, these situations. And you work in career services. And I know that a portion of what you do is advising students on how to evaluate fit and how to present themselves. So I'd love to get your perspective on this professional authenticity piece. Sure. And I love the story of how Sheila and Tamara met. I think it's... Um, I think when we first kind of go into new professional settings, whether that be a job or a bar association, we often have, you know, the Sheila moment, right? Where you're sitting, you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And then we, we meet, we meet a Tam. And I think when we start off in the profession, we are often the Sheila in the story, but I think our goal is to ultimately be the Tam in the story, right? So that we can bring other people in and make other, other people have these great experiences too. Um, for me, when I talk to students and graduates about fit, I think fundamentally from a 10,000 foot view, and I know, I know, I know we'll talk more about this and get more detailed, but I think it is really 100% about knowing who you are and self-assessment. And I think you can't really begin to understand what you want in a career, what you want in a professional experience until you really know who you are and understanding how you prefer to communicate, how you make friends, right? How you decide what makes sense for you, what doesn't make sense for you. And when you come into the profession, you really are bringing all of your experiences with you. And that is the stuff that is so meaningful and so rich. And that's what adds to the diversity and wonderfulness of our profession. But to Sheila's point, that can be challenging. And there are a lot of situations where 
maybe you aren't comfortable doing that or for whatever reason, it's not the right time. And, and I think um, I certainly have a lot of respect for that, but I think that there is an element at some point of owning your story and finding out how you can share it authentically, um, being true to yourself, but also allowing yourself the freedom to really bring yourself to the profession as much as you possibly can. Um, and so that takes some work. There are some tools out there. Um, they all have limitations. None of them are perfect. Um, I have found personally the MBTI to be helpful for me, at least as a starting point to understand some of my preferences. And that has helped me interact with people, communicate better, and start to really own and feel validated for the things that I bring to the table. And so I really encourage people to kind of go through that process. There's, a, I mean, that, that goes way beyond the scope of what we have time for today, but there are some really good tools out there. Um, again, none of them perfect, but a combination of them can really, really be helpful. Um, but I think, you know, when it comes to meeting people and networking, certainly there are a lot of challenges right now being virtual, but there's also a lot of really good opportunities, right? I don't have the chance to, you know, sit down with Shada at a meeting and have tea, but I do have the chance at any given time, given some time zone challenges, to, you know, pick up the phone or Zoom with her to catch up with her, or get to know a little bit more about what's going on in her career. And I think that the way, the way we're living right now does provide some unique opportunities to continue to find your fit by finding people um, who you can connect with. Um, and I am thankful for that in the ABA and the YLD and, and certainly thankful um, for these relationships that allow me to do that. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Joanne. Tam, I would love to get your perspective on this because one of the things that stuck out to me about your story, about why you wanted to get involved in the ABA was because you were one of a few lawyers of color in your state and you wanted to see people that looked like you. Talk to us about why representation matters and how seeing authenticity and being authentic looks to you. Yeah, sure. So <laughs> this is such a good thing to talk about and um, such a good group to talk about it with um, uh, such a good group of authentic people. This was and is uh, a struggle for me. It, like I said before, is a very lonely experience uh, to be the only person who looks like you in the room every day. It is constantly to be the other. I, through that, have found myself um, to often have many experiences where I can't truly uh, connect and relate with my colleagues on every level or every issue. And I'll say that's been acutely uh, the situation considering where we are as a nation and with social justice and racial justice issues uh, we've been experiencing as of late. Um, so I will say representation matters, period. Why? Well, first, uh, we all need someone who looks like us so we can see ourselves at the highest level, um, what we can aspire to be. And someone has to be there to bust through the door like the Kool-Aid man and hold it open for the rest of us. And second, we have to have a safe place, a place to be unapologetically ourselves and to sit in the realness of who we are, our culture and the challenges we may face that could be unique to us for whatever that us is. And lastly, there is just power in having someone who looks like you speaking life into you, uh, speaking words into action and inspiring you to challenge yourself and to push yourself to be better and to do better. So all that to say, yes, uh, representation matters. Um, so I want to say with a caveat, don't get me wrong, I love being a South Dakota young lawyer. Um, I wear that title proudly. I have great mentors and colleagues here, uh, but at the same time, it's important for professional and personal wellness to have a safe place, to feel like you fit, to be connected, to be heard, to be seen. And for all of us, I think that bucket has to be filled and to be replenished. And when it is replenished, the well is full. And then I can give of my 
myself. I can be me in the most real way and I can fit in any group that looks like or does not look like me. And for me, that is what authenticity is. And Sheila talked about that, the navigating when to blend in and when to stand out. But for me, when I have representation, I'm reminded of who I am. And I learned to stand proudly in that, to stand in my foundation. And Joanne talked about that. That's a vulnerable place to be. Um, but when people look like you in the room, you're reminded how proud you are to be you. And so you're encouraged and motivated to stand in that truth. And with that, boy, you can do anything. You can walk into a room that doesn't look like you and be whatever that is, and blend into the crowds that look like whatever they may look like. So I would just encourage folks to know that it's okay to seek out folks that look like them so that you can be empowered to be you in a room where you may not have someone that looks like you. Thanks, Tamara. Um, Shada, I also wanted to get your perspective here because one of the things that was really impactful for me after we met was when I received a firm holiday card from you. I um, I kept this tradition every year when it's time for holiday cards to come out, I, I take them up on my door to be like, oh, look, I've got all these cards. All these people know me. They love me, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> um, but the first year after I met Shada, I got a holiday card and it was in her cultural holiday card and not the traditional holiday cards that you typically see around December. And it was impactful for me that it was a firm holiday card. It was for Baron Liebman. Um, if I said that wrong, I'm sorry. I'm sure she'll fix, <laughs> she'll fix it. But I was so impressed that your firm let you do something like that. I want you to talk to us about how your firm supported and embrace your authenticity and bringing that aspect of yourself to work and how that has been helpful in your career and your work environment. So this is one of my favorite things, like one of my favorite times of the year, every year when we send these cards. Um, but my background is that I'm Persian and we celebrate Persian New Year on the vernal equinox. So on the first day of spring or slightly before, I'm sending New Year's cards out to people. And um, to their enduring credit, my firm actually asked me, like they came to me and said, hey, are there any cultural holidays or events around which you might like to send something from you and the firm, both because it's a meaningful cultural celebration for you and because it's a personal touch point around which you can be you and connect with our clients. Um, so it was, they, they left it up to me, you know, it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a, 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 a demand, it was a request. Do you wanna consider this? But that was, I will be honest, an instance where I was sitting there asking myself, is this okay? Like, should I be selective about who I send this to? And I asked, I openly asked and our, you know, our firm's leadership said to me, we think this is great, you do you. So as a fairly new associate, like literally the first year that I was here, I was sending cultural holiday cards out to our clients and friends of the firm. Um, I did get a few responses back that were like, hey, what is this? Like from the recipients, not from people at work. And it was an opportunity for me to actually plug like other places that I was involved or other cultural organizations that were important to me and to get to say, you know, you, you get a regular holiday card from us as well. And this was just an opportunity for like a little extra fun. Um, and by year two and year three and year four, I had people asking me, you know, when's that Persian New Year card going to come? Like, what's the design going to be this year? And that was really touching for me. Um, so that's kind of a nod towards the fact that professional authenticity can look very different. And um, you can have different kind of scope and opportunity to do that depending on where you work, how nice the people are that you work with, um, in what environment and at what point in time in your career. And although there was a little bit of hesitation on my part, like the, is, is this gonna be okay kind of feeling, um, ultimately having that encouragement or having that, you know, what kind of Joanne referred to earlier in the conversation as that nudge, a nudge from somebody else to say, hey, do you wanna do this? Do you wanna try this? Do you wanna join this? Um, was ultimately where that started for me. 
Thank you, Shada. You guys had some really, really great uh, thoughts on professional authenticity. I'm going to kick it back to Shada, who's going to talk about our next topic. So I wanna to turn to kind of the importance of professional networks and to also highlight for you in a personal way what that's looked like for me and for the rest of the group. Um, and in, in hopes that it might kind of give you some nuggets of what it could look like for you in your own practice setting or in your own kind of phase of development. And although we've talked about bar service and bar organizations, obviously we started this journey in this conversation with how we met at the ABA Young Lawyers Division um, bar organizations are certainly a really great opportunity, but not the only good opportunity. And you don't, um, you know, you don't have to be playing golf with the local judges or the CEOs or going to someone's lake house over the weekend to be able to really successfully leverage the network that's available to you and, and to build into the areas that are important to you. Um, so you can certainly consider other non-lawyer professional organizations. So literally professional groups that are for like financial planners and insurance folks and um, you know, maybe like women's focused or minority focused, whatever it is that kind of resonates for you. Um, that's one option. Another option is other community involvement that's important to you. Um, another option is literally the people you already work with in your existing job who are relevant, even if that's not going to be your forever job. You never know where your next, you know, kind of referral or connection is going to come from. So if you volunteer at a local dog shelter, if you're in a running club, or if you're in a baking group, all of those are networks that might contribute to your personal and professional development. Um, now those networks might contribute in different ways and it's certainly at different paces, but the kind of the, the broader theme is that everybody has access to different kinds of avenues and they're all valuable and worth developing. In essence, what I have personally found to be the most impactful and productive pathways to developing a network, whatever that network looks like for you are two things. The first is those which you engage in with genuine interest, um, like Sheila talked about with authenticity, because you are likely to make a positive impression where you are really committed and people can tell when you are happily engaged and when you aren't. That comes through in your behavior and the way that you carry yourself. Um, so that's the first category, places you engage in genuine interest. And the second is those where you really apply yourself because that's your opportunity to showcase yourself, showcase your personality, what makes you a neat person, what makes you a reliable professional, what qualities you bring to the table that will lead other people to respect you and wanna work with you. Um, so I always feel like, and I know this sentiment is shared um, by, by this group in particular, I always feel like those networks are an opportunity to showcase yourself and your work ethic, good or bad. So if you volunteer, you get involved and you do a diligent job, people will notice and they will remember and they will want to work with you in other contexts. If you volunteer or get involved and you don't apply yourself or you half-ass it, people probably won't think, well, after all, it's just your volunteer stuff. They'll probably think you stink with follow through at your regular job as well. So be mindful that this is all advertising about yourself and there is such thing as bad advertising. So my one plug is utilize and apply yourself to the opportunities that you're actually really genuinely interested in because that's where you're likely to do a good job and make a good impression. Um, so you have to do the things that make sense for you and that you like and places that you can really shine as opposed to just resume line items. So for example, my personal start with my local bar organization looked like this. Um, I was looking for a job big surprise. I graduated law school in 2011 into one of the worst job markets and specifically legal job markets in quite some time. Jobs were scarce, if not non-existent. And in the process of networking with other lawyers and trying to build my professional resources, one lawyer I talked to recommended that I get involved with my county bar association. And at that time I was unemployed and I was thinking, how is this going to land me a position? Um, but I joined, I signed up for committees, I volunteered at events, and what it actually gave me was exposure to a professional community, which not only helped me get that first legal job, it helped me with every other professional milestone and stepping stone I have had since. So me volunteering my time with my local bar association gave me a place to make contacts and friends, um, establish a good professional reputation for myself within my community. Ultimately, that's what I needed, like a shot to show people how I carry myself and how I work. And since I couldn't do that in a job, since I didn't have one, 
I did that with kind of this next best opportunity. It gave me a place to display really important professional traits like follow through and drive and attention to detail, which are the very kinds of things that lead a prospective employer to want to hire you. Um, it gave me a space in which to develop and display leadership strengths like Sheila was talking about earlier. And it propelled me to my second job where I am now a partner at my firm. And even now as a lawyer in private practice who will probably work here until I die, um, but who is still responsible for generating business and referrals and maintaining a professional reputation, that foundation that I built through my bar service continues to help me at this stage of my career as well. So it's not a finish line kind of thing. Um, I do want to give some space to hear perspectives from the rest of our panel. So Sheila, to start with you, I know that you are involved with a lot of different uh, organizations. Um, and as a fellow lawyer in private practice, um, what would you say is one organization or avenue in, of involvement that you think other people might be surprised to hear that you're involved with? Thanks, Shada. Happy to talk about that, but I want to take a slight detour to talk about um, the audition piece that you talked about, about bar service, um, and just kind of a, a unique story. So shortly after I met Shada, probably maybe a year or so after I met Shada, so let's give it some time for me to have shown, uh, and sorry, the lights in my office kind of just go off and on sometimes with their motion sensor, um, but uh, probably a year or so after I met Shada, she called me one day and said, hey, we have a client that has an issue in South Carolina. Can you handle this? And I was like, absolutely happy to do it. And I would like to think that it was based on our relationship and the work ethic and whatnot that I demonstrated to Shada. I also know Shada very well. She um, does not suffer fools. She's pretty much always on top of her stuff. And so for her to have handed me a client of hers to take care of an issue in South Carolina, I thought that spoke very highly of the work that I had done. Um, and all she had seen is my ABA work. Um, she had not seen, we'd not worked on a case or anything like that, but she, based on the work that we'd done in the ABA, had trusted, well, had trusted me to work on that. And so I thought, you know, that's a really good tangible example of how, um, you know, doing good work in these professional environments really can help you. And I mean, that was a really impactful client for me from a development standpoint within the firm. And so, you know, she was getting help from a client and it turned out to be really impactful for me on, you know, on the business side. So um, I really cannot stress enough kind of the audition piece of it. Um, but to your actual question about um, involved in organizations, I think um, the surprising thing would be that I'm involved in so many of the organizations. I can't think of one that would probably surprise a lot of people. Uh, I do a ton with bar service. I do with locally. Uh, I'm in the Junior League of Columbia. That one might be surprising um, because the mission of the Junior League is really to promote happy and healthy kids and kids in mass quantities make me nervous. Like I'm happy to go read to some children. Um, but when you start getting like 60 or so at like a, a fair or something, it makes me very nervous. That's call that the only child in me. Um, so people might find that odd that I volunteer in that capacity, but that has been a really, really great way for me to be able to serve my community. And it started out in a completely non-legal way, which was really cool, but I've also served as the league attorney and now I do the league finances. So it's still kind of legal. It all just kind of comes right on back. <laughs> um, but I really, really enjoy serving and doing things in the community and things that either can help me further hone my legal skills or just get involved in a way to give back, um, you know, to Tam's point, representation matters. And so, you know, if I can show people a different perspective about what a lawyer looks like, what a young lawyer looks like, what a black lawyer looks like, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And, and again, that's a nod towards it's a legal opportunity, even if it's not a legal organization um, and applying yourself in, in categories or organizations that you have that genuine interest in and because you want to serve is, is the foundation to all of it. 
Um, so Joanne, you're in the unique position where your professional networks serve not only yourself, but also benefit the law students that you work with. So I wanted to ask you to share with the group, how do you see that play out in terms of professional networks? Sure. So I think fundamentally, the legal profession is one of relationships. No matter what you do with your career, um, you're going to be relying on relationships to advance your career, to support your career, to pay your bills, right? Relationships are really a fundamental part of this. And so for me, it, my work in the AVA, YLD, and, and other professional organizations comes from a, a desire to want to have good, strong relationships. Um, and specifically with a wide variety of people. Um, I love this profession. It is not without its faults. Um, we can be better, but I think that it is my responsibility, even though I'm not practicing, to contribute to it in any way that I can. And so for me, my involvement really allowed me personally to get really great leadership skills. Um, it allowed me to, of course, meet not only these wonderful women, but so many other people who I learn from. I, you know, you know, to to Sheila's point, like I really worked hard to bring my A game, right? Because I wanted to be someone that people could rely on, um, people would count on, people would think of me for opportunities. And so that's sort of what I got out of it. And I was able to use the skills that I earned in the YLD to sort of help me advance in my own career, give me opportunities within my own career to um, lead committees and organizations. And it has transitioned now into doing a lot of work around courtroom, um, courthouse lactation rooms, which is something that really started in the YLD in some ways. And so that work sort of continues for me. And it's something that I'm really, really committed to. And it's allowed me to have so many great opportunities. So for that, that's a sort of my motivation and, and what I can um, what I can claim from that work. And then for my students, you know, I think being involved in, in the YLD and other professional organizations gives me insight into issues that the legal profession is facing, helps me understand um, some of the hot areas of career and growth, and it gives me credibility in my work, right? It allows me to share with my students um, firsthand experiences with what I know to be true. It allows me to connect my students and graduates to um, the people that I meet. Just a few months ago, I was able to connect a student that I was working with and to Sheila. And I was meeting with her and talking with her and I was like, oh my gosh, she needs to meet Sheila. And she did. And Sheila, of course, you know, did, you know, exceeded all of my expectations, of course. And um, that was a really proud moment for me because without that, I would have never been able to connect her to a Sheila and she needed a Sheila. And I was able to be that bridge for her. And um, so that for me is the value that I can give back to, you know, I, I've taken a lot from the YLD, right? I like to think I've, you know, I've done the work, I've earned um, the positions, but I've, I've been able to really take a lot. And this is a way for me to, to give some of it back and to, um, to be able to connect people, whether it's geography or practice area or um, community involvement, it's, it's, um, it's really like, a nice full circle kind of experience for me. And I love that concept. It almost made me cry. <laughs> oh my God. We all need a Sheila <laughs> from time to need a Sheila. And I was glad to be able to give her a Sheila. And I, I love that concept of serving as a bridge, using your own professional network, not just for the benefit of yourself and your personal professional development, but using it as a tool with which you propel other people forward. So um, transitioning off of that, Tamara, despite being well into your career, you still stay engaged with your law school, which may surprise some people. Can you share a little bit about that and also highlight where and how that engagement continues to help you both personally and professionally? Sure, I would love to. Uh, Joanne stole much of my thunder, so I'll, I'll try to weave in some new, new fresh material here. Um, so going. I don't know, this happens. <laughs> Great you minds, everyone. There. You got more material in there. <laughs> Uh, so we'll start with this primer. Uh, South Dakota does not have many people. I know that surprises everyone watching here. Uh, so with that, we have one law school. We all pour into the profession from the University of South Dakota School of Law. Um, 
So really, it's a community. It's a family. I know that sounds cheesy, but really, it is. Um, within a 10-year span, they were either your classmate right above you, right below you, or you've heard of them. Uh, so it's a real thing. Um, and what is so cool is every South Dakota lawyer really feels that way, even the ones we adopt from neighboring states. Um, and so it's a true belief that we hold on to. And what's priority to me is to give back to the place that made me so much of who I am as a professional. So that's one why. Um, another why for me is maybe the more important one, and this is kind of to Shada and Joanne's point of being a bridge um, mentorship. I believe very firmly that I would be nowhere near where I am today without some amazing people, some divine intervention and some guidance and good advice. Uh, and to me, there's no way to repay that debt, but the way to try to repay it is to help pay it forward and to help the next generation. And I think just frankly, uh, as people taking up space on this earth, um, we owe it to soften the path of those who follow us. So this is especially true, I think, for underrepresented groups and first-generation attorneys, um, you know, for uh, I am one of those people, um, or just anyone um, who doesn't quite know what they're doing. I think if you have the blueprint, uh, why not share it? If you've learned an unspoken rule um, the hard way, why not lend a hand of someone else? I think we should all be in the trenches together. And I try to celebrate the mentality that we should nurture the next generation. And I think, um, to say this a million times, that's just really true for underrepresented groups. Um, really, when one of us succeeds, we all succeed. And that's really, to me, how it helps my engagement is just to be embedded in the next generation, to be rejuvenated, um, to know that we are all a part of this together and to stay fresh and stay hip because I'm a cool lawyer to, you know, back and cool or to back and mean girls. Um, so I think that's how it helps my engagement is just to be the bridge. Um, there's no need to put more or any other words to it. So those would be my thoughts. I love it. Thank you. So I just want to note how much of what Sheila talked about around professional authenticity carries over into how you build and utilize professional networks. Um, and also acknowledge something that she raised, which is, you know, essentially sometimes people will raise the question of, don't I have to be the prim and proper version of myself around people if I want to be professional? And how does that jive with authenticity? And the answer is kind of, I mean, professional authenticity doesn't mean the realest, most personal version of yourself to the exclusion of the professionalism part. Um, and I think everyone here, the four of us would acknowledge that that looks different depending on where you live, what you practice, your sphere of interactions, what stage you're at in your professional career, sometimes what you look like, unfortunately. But some of that is also effectuated by forming professional networks and within those networks also forming authentic friendships, which was a lot of how this group came about. So having professional friends who encourage you and give you advice, promote you for opportunities, plug your services, that's not only good for your career, it's good for your overall wellness and happiness and long-term career satisfaction. So um, closing out this topic, I wanna to transition over to Joanne to walk us through our next one. So I now want to turn our attention to the topic of the board of directors. Um, by now in your career, you have heard about mentors and sponsors. Um, but a board of directors is something that's a little different. And when the four of us talk about board of directors, um, we mean sort of this trusted group of people that you have intentionally chosen to provide you with advice and counsel, um, discipline sometimes, crisis management, and that people that you owe sort of a duty of loyalty and care to. So really very much like a real board of directors. And for us, I think, um, it's been a really important sort of unintentional structure that we've created, but it has served us well, I think, personally and professionally. Um, and these are in relationships that I think everyone needs. 
they don't necessarily all have to come from the same place. Like we all happen to start in the YLD, um, but it, it worked out that way, right? That was really good pizza. And <laughs> it allows us to really bond and connect and find out that a lawyer from Florida and South Dakota and South Carolina and Oregon, um, despite coming from totally different backgrounds, we really do have a lot in common that we were able to sort of discover through really good conversations and authentic um, sort of sharing of ourselves. And I think that that comes from really being able to trust one another. And so for us, a board of directors, you know, when we talk about advice and counsel, we rely on each other um, to come to one another if we have issues in our career or personal things that we want to work through or talk through um, because we have created this sort of safe space to be able to get a diverse group of opinions about things that are important to us. Um, sometimes we all need to remind each other of how great we are, right? We have those times in our career where things aren't going as we expected and we really need someone who can, and who can build us up and cheer us on and can celebrate us and can encourage us to um, you know, apply for that award or apply for that position. And so that is where a board of directors can really come in handy. And then uh, crisis management. Sometimes in your personal life, things, things get tough. And I think no time is that more clear than in 2020. I think we, um, we have all been dealing with things that are really hard and stressful and unprecedented. And um, having a group that you can go to with those feelings to understand how these things may impact your career, your family, and having a space where you can talk about that is so critical to your professional growth and to your wellness, right? It's so important. And then finally, like a duty of loyalty and care. Like I, I treat this board of directors here, um, it's sacred, right? When someone needs me, when if anyone in this group needs me, I really work hard to make sure that I am focused and bring my whole self to the conversation. Um, I try not to be distracted when we have, um, when we have time, when we make time for one another. We've even throughout before COVID, right? We made time to sort of FaceTime and catch up and, and see how everyone was doing. And so for me, that's been instrumental. And I think um, something I want other people to have as well, because it's been so valuable to me. And so um, I want to take the next few moments because I know that we, um, you know, we, we can't be here all day. Unfortunately, I wish we could. <laughs> we'll have to sort of catch up after this, ladies. Um, but I wanted to sort of ask around and just see like how, how you have, um, I don't want to say valued this board of directors, but how do you think that this is important for other people to have? And why do you think that this is such an important relationship? And so Tam, we'll start with you. Really good question. I love that I get to be first up because I can just bleed my heart out and still everyone oh, else's thunder. Yeah, that's right. Take it all. Take it all. <laughs> Take the glory. Um, so I think I want to start with acknowledging the three of you um, as my first board of directors. Um, and I'll say the best board of directors I've ever had. So um, I'll give you that. Um, but uh, just so much love and appreciation for the three of you as, as who you are to me and what this board of directors does for me. And I'll share with the audience kind of a, a real note because we're in this together at this point. Um, I am definitely in a space in life where I am challenging, my, challenging myself uh, to push forward and to dig deep. A quote I'm living by right now is feel the fear and do it anyway. And why this is relevant to you <laughs> is um, that this is really where I'm feeling um, the benefits of my board of directors. This is where they manifest. Um, so what I find is that first my board of directors holds me accountable. Um, they give me some real tough love, if we're going to be honest here. So the other side of that is there's a lot of nurturing and love. Um, and even when you don't know that you need it, um, it's there for you. And I really appreciate that. Um, my board has been my sounding board, my ideal think tank. Um, I really appreciate the intervention when the ideas are not so great. Um, and <laughs> they're also my hype team. You know, sometimes you just have to have some somebody gas you up, whether it's sending a selfie or a bad joke, you know, and they're like, yeah, that's, that's a good dad joke. It's funny. And they're like, 
you know, secretly, you know, when you can't see their face on a text. Um, but most importantly, uh, my board is my foundation when I need grounding. And I think that is very true right now when a lot of us are, you know, lacking those in-person tangible um, times together. And so that is what my board has been for me. And the main thing is, my board always shows up for me. It's like the bat signal when our group text goes off and someone's like SOS, we're all in. We coordinate time zones from Portland, you know, to South Carolina and Florida, we figure it out. And that's amazing. So what I try to do is the same, try to be available, understanding, kind, but most importantly, loyal. And um, I try to give them the real me and I love the real them. And I think that circles back into authenticity, which we've talked about. Um, and one thing I just really want to note that I think is important is that a true board will always validate your experience and your feelings um, in that present moment, but always work with you to objectively, because what we feel may not always be rational, right? That's okay. I'm always in that boat, um, to objectively get to the best outcome for you in that moment. Um, and we have had the bat signal out to that point many times um, on my end. So those are my thoughts on that, Joanne. I knew I was going to be the one to mess up the mute of all of us. I knew I was going to be the one to mess up the mute. Okay. I was hoping <laughs> we were going to get through the whole thing without it. I was going to oh. say like, no. All right, Sheila, what about you? What What is this BOD meant to you? Well, so Tam stole like all of the, the things to talk about, about how great um, this board of directors, and if you see me looking down, it's just because that's where her square is on my screen as I'm looking at her as I say this. Um, but one of the things that has meant a lot to me with this board are that we are all very similarly high functioning. Like I am someone, I don't have a ton of close friends. I have trust issues that the board probably all knows about. And for the audience, you don't need to know all the details. But that has lent itself to uh, it being difficult sometimes for me to open up to people or for me to take advice from people. And when I meet this group of people that are as high functioning as I am, that have similar goals and mindsets, it presents a safe place for me to... Um, talk about things, to ask questions, to express things, because I know that they also very sim are very similar to me, or they at least know me and know how I think and how I process things. So that's a given. I don't have to spend time talking about my lens on a topic. They know what my lens is. The net, they can just go to the next step of here's the thought process. Here's the advice. Here's the, oh, this is great. Oh, maybe you probably shouldn't do this. Have you thought about it this way? And that is a really invaluable perspective because it allows me to like have mirrors, but also still see myself. I have four I have three other mirrors, but they still show me versions of myself. Um, the shared commitment piece is huge, um, not only because it provides a place for us to um, know that we're going to be there for each other, but it also, for me, helps me stay on my game like makes me bring my A game to whatever we're doing because I know that everyone else is going to be doing the same thing. And that filters out. Like I know that, you know, maybe there's going to be another client from Shada and maybe there's not, but I know that I don't ever need to slack in our friendship because then that could bleed into the professional and not that that's the point, but I, we always, when we do things together, when we're working on projects, it makes us all step up. And even when we're taking care of each other, we're all stepping up, bringing our A game. If someone's sick, we're all figuring out how to like get them things. If someone's having a baby, we're all figuring out how to, we're all bringing our absolute A game to make things happen. And that's really cool to be around that energy, that same energy of people who are very similar and like-minded. And I cannot stress how good it is to be able to be vulnerable and authentic and have a safe space. And like, for me, it's a big deal to have a safe space with similar people, 
that know those things that are also billing hours that have family commitments that are trying to do well in all their bar activities and trying to be the best that they can be that feels good to be able to be vulnerable in that space um it's just it's it's invaluable and i am so like thankful my ABA dues are worth it a billion times over um, for <laughs> to be able to have this because I have uh, like this program is almost like a love letter to you guys because <laughs> I have never had this before and I am just uh, so thankful so I went off on a tangent about what this board of directors means but you guys keep me straight you keep me focused and you keep me like safe in a little bubble so thank you. And I think it's perfectly uh, wonderful that Shada is sort of the closing word on this, because I think even as we um, have our sort of board of director meetings, for me, Shada is the one who really sort of brings it all home and like gives it like condenses everything into one like beautifully, neatly packaged um, nugget of wisdom. So no pressure, okay. um, but you're up. <laughs> no pressure. It might be because I bill my time. <laughs> so. yes. um, I mean, for me, this topic goes, brings us all the way home to the title of this program, which is about taking your authentic identity and leveraging your squad. And board of directors is where all of that comes together. And I think about this- See, I told you she'd do it. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just stole the title. <laughs> I think about this for myself in the context of like professional advice is a real game changer because all of us, especially in the legal profession, we understand that knowledge is power and the level of knowledge that you have on your own is great, but wouldn't it be helpful if you had more and you had it for free and you had it from people who genuinely really care about you? So that's where a personal and professional board of directors kind of shines or manifests for me. And I think a couple of thoughts on this topic are, you know, Sheila talked about how helpful it is to have people who understand you. And I think that to build off of that, having professional and personal advice from people who both understand you and respect you, and from people who bring at least enough diversity of perspective to the table, that you're going to hear a little bit different from what you would have come up with on your own. Um, you know, people already mentioned kind of this concept of like intervention when you need it, even when you haven't asked for it. Um, that's honestly kind of hard to get on a professional level. I mean, as an employment lawyer, and I know Sheila can attest to this also, at work, you often get professional advice after you've already messed up. You know, an employer will come, this is not a knock against any of my clients, but an employer will come in and kind of tell you when you've already gone off the deep end, right? Like you've got a problem you need to fix. Whereas a board of directors, personal and professional, will kind of sit you down and give you little nudges and little, you know, like corrective kind of pieces of information, which you are then free to implement as you feel is appropriate for you. And everyone in this group still has a lot of respect for the word no. You know, sometimes there's an intervention and the person will say, thanks for your opinion, I really value it. I'm still gonna go this direction. And that's an appropriate outcome. And having a group that is both willing to give you that honest assessment and reflection and respect you so much as a professional and individual when you still decide to take your own path to it, I think is one of the most invaluable things that I have found in the course of my own, not just professional development, but also quite honestly, professional happiness. So those are, those are my thoughts, my nuggets. Beautiful they are. Tam, take us home. Let's jump on the train, ladies. I just wanna say, Shada, that is such a astute observation, of course, from you. But I think truly when you're authentically you, you're able to stand firmly in what you need or want. And those two have to be in alignment. So such a great point. Wow, we talked about a lot, a whole lot. I told you guys we're extra, so we spoke about a lot of things today. But truly, uh, we hope that something really resonates with you and speaks to a struggle or a hope or a goal that you may have. 
We opened the program with identifying what we each expected to gain from the ABA YLD. And ultimately, Destiny intervened with some delicious New York City pizza, some great conversation, and ultimately, a wonderful friendship. Now we close with demonstrating to you what we found with what Sheila accurately talked about our love letter to each other, <laughs> which we maybe should have saved for offline, but uh, more <laughs> a dynamic squad. I'll take, I'll take that feedback. I'll, I'll, take that. <laughs> I'll take that. A dynamic squad who works fearlessly to advocate for one another and never fails to show up for each other. So today we encourage each of you to be your best and true self, but further to find a network who will join you in that effort to advance your goals and to celebrate your success. And remember, when you embrace your vulnerabilities, celebrate your authenticity and nurture your networks and champion yourself, the possibility is of the most splendid possibility or outcome. Thank you so much for joining us today.